country's most senior law enforcement official was investigating links between the president's campaign team and Russia. If an independent special prosecutor is appointed, there still can be some faith that we can get to the bottom of this. If not, everyone will suspect cover-up. Yes. But President Trump claims James Comey had lost the confidence of almost everyone in Washington, Republican and Democrat alike. We will be looking at the impact his decision could have, also this lunchtime. The 11-year-old girl who died on a school trip to a theme park in Staffordshire, her family say their world has been torn apart. No Conservatives will face charges for breaches of expenses rules over the 2015 general election, says the Crown Prosecution Service. Education election pledges, both Labour and the Liberal Democrats, say they would invest billions in schools over the next four years. And 50 years after Pink Floyd's debut album, the new exhibition at London's v &A Museum, celebrating one of the world's most famous rock bands. Later on BBC London, a private ambulance company apologises after patients in Hertfordshire say they missed appointments. And as education becomes the latest election battleground, we look at how the party pledges will affect London. Good afternoon and welcome to the BBC News at One. President Trump has defended his decision to sack the head of the FBI without warning, saying he'd lost the confidence of almost everyone in Washington. James Comey learnt of his fate last night when he was handed a note as he briefed FBI agents in L.A. Mr Comey had been leading an investigation into alleged links between Mr Trump's election campaign last year and Russia. But the White House insists he was dismissed for mishandling an inquiry into Hillary Clinton's emails last year. From Washington, here's Ali Mabou. Absolutely explosive news out of Washington tonight. This is a Fox News alert. FBI Director James Comey has been fired by the President of the United States. Americans have learned to expect almost anything from their president, but this really was high drama. FBI Director James Comey wasn't even in Washington. He was addressing FBI staff in Los Angeles when he learned he'd been sacked. A short while later, a letter arrived at FBI headquarters. You are hereby terminated and removed from office, effective immediately. While I greatly appreciate you informing me on three separate occasions that I'm not under investigation, I nevertheless concur with the judgment of the Department of Justice that you are not able to effectively lead the Bureau. And it was signed, Donald Trump. He's become more famous than me. Except the Trump campaign was being investigated by the FBI for its links to Russia. James Comey was leading the investigation, and now he's gone. Are people going to suspect cover-up? Absolutely. If an independent special prosecutor is appointed, there still can be some faith that we can get to the bottom of this. If not, everyone will suspect cover-up. Speaking on US TV, the president's advisor dismissed that notion. It says nothing to do with Russia. It has everything to do with whether the current FBI director has the president's confidence and can faithfully and capably execute his duties. Well, the shockwaves from this decision are not just being felt here at the FBI, but across this city and beyond. For his supporters, this is evidence that Donald Trump is a strong leader. But for many others, this just adds to the perception that this country is now being run by a man who is intolerant of those who disagree with him and who don't entirely do his bidding. Ali McBall, BBC News in Washington. Well, the shock sacking of James Comey has led to U.S. Democrats and some Republicans intensifying their calls for an independent investigation into links between the Trump presidential election campaign and Russia, as Richard Lister reports. James Comey's impact on the American presidency has been profound. Democrats say he swung the election against Hillary Clinton. Trump supporters say he's undermined the White House. But the question hanging over his sacking is why now? I made a mistake using a private email. When, days before the election, Mr Comey reopened the investigation into whether Mrs Clinton had compromised national security by using a private email server, Donald Trump was thrilled. It took guts for Director Comey to make the move that he made 
in light of the kind of opposition he had. But then came this. Although there is evidence of potential violations of the statutes regarding the handling of classified information, our judgment is that no reasonable prosecutor would bring such a case. But seven months on, the Justice Department has suddenly decided Mr. Comey had no right to announce the case was closed. The Deputy Attorney General, Rod Rosenstein, said in a memo, the FBI is unlikely to regain public and congressional trust until it has a director who understands the gravity of the mistakes and pledges never to repeat them. Democrats, though, think it's another announcement from Mr Comey which got him sacked, that he was investigating possible Russian support for Donald Trump. And that includes investigating the nature of any links between individuals associated with the Trump campaign and the Russian government and whether there was any coordination between the campaign and Russia's efforts. Mr Trump's first national security adviser, Michael Flynn, had to resign after lying about his talks with Russian officials. But one senior Republican believes Mr Comey's sacking could jeopardise the investigation by the Senate. Richard Burr said his dismissal further confuses an already difficult investigation by the committee. If there ends up being nothing there, I'll be the first to acknowledge that. But boy, oh boy, with the president's actions, not just today, but his comments over the last few weeks, his whole approach towards our investigation really um, raises a huge level of concern with me. But Donald Trump said this morning, Comey lost the confidence of almost everyone in Washington, Republican and Democrat alike. When things calm down, they will be thanking me. But for many, this sacking will raise more questions than answers. And on the day he's due to meet the Russian foreign minister, Mr Trump's ensured the controversy about his relations with Moscow will continue. Richard Lister, BBC News. Our Washington correspondent Gary O'Donoghue is outside the FBI headquarters for us in Washington. So President Trump is defiant this morning, but how much of an impact could his decision have? Sophie, they've seen some things here at the J. Edgar Hoover building over the years, but really the sacking of a, a director less than four years into a 10-year term has rocked this organisation, rocked Washington, really. The president has been out there this morning, as you would imagine, on social media, defending his decision, saying people will thank him when things have calmed down and lambasting the Democrats, really, saying they weren't very keen on James Comey at one stage and now, as he put it, they play so sad. The question now is the timing. Why now? Because the things that were cited in all the letters that were released yesterday talk about the way James Comey handled the Hillary Clinton investigation. Some, of, some parts of that investigation Donald Trump praised. But of course there is this overriding issue, the links with Russia, the potential, the possible coordination between the Trump campaign and Russia, subpoenas potentially flying around, people asking for immunity from prosecution. It's something that had got under the president's skin and there are few here in Washington who believe that wasn't a major, major factor in his summary dismissal of James Comey yesterday evening. Gary O'Donoghue, thank you. An 11-year-old girl who died after falling from a water ride at a theme park in Staffordshire yesterday has been named as Eva Janeth from Leicester. She was on a school trip to Drayton Manor Park when she fell from a boat on one of the rides. Our correspondent Phil Mackey is at the theme park now. Yes, Sophie, uh, this time yesterday you'd have heard a lot of noise. The park was filled, the roller coasters would have been thundering around and there would have been screams from the school children enjoying their rides. 24 hours on, things are much quieter. The, th the park is deserted and investigations have begun into how an 11-year-old died 24 hours ago. Eva Janat had come to the park on a school trip. The emergency services arrived quickly. Staff and paramedics tried to save her, but she was pronounced dead after being airlifted to hospital. Today, investigators are examining the Splash Canyon ride and are trying to work out how she fell into the water. There is a height restriction, which means that young children who are between three and three and a half feet tall have to be accompanied by an adult. Although people aren't strapped in, they are told to remain seated. Four years ago, another young boy, Patrick Tracy, fell into the water on the same ride. One hand was still holding onto the bar and he was half stood to wave. And at that point, the boat 
sort of bumped against the edges of the rapids and he just was tossed headfirst into the water. Um, I panicked and um, I didn't know what to do, but luckily there was a member of the public, a lovely lady next to me, that just said, hold on, I've got him, and jumped over this fence that we were leaning on. She jumped over a second fence and dragged Patrick out of the water. Drayton Manor says it's checking through its records and liaising with the health and safety executive. Eva's school is shut today. Staff and pupils have been offered counselling. She was a lovely, sweet-natured girl, and she was loved by everyone at the school. As a school and as a community, we are trying to make sense of this terrible tragedy. Our thoughts and our prayers are with Eva's family at this most difficult time. Everybody's in shock. Everybody's in utter shock. There's no words. I mean, myself, I couldn't sleep last night thinking of this. You know, you, I've got kids that probably will be in the future going to a trip like this. I probably wouldn't send my children. The park is shut today as a mark of respect. No decision has been made on when it will reopen. Well, we're expecting an announcement on the park's reopening in the next couple of hours. We've got a statement from the family uh, now. It said that yesterday our world was torn apart by the news that our daughter and sister had lost her life in tragic circumstances. Ava was a beautiful girl who was full of love and always smiling. Words cannot describe the pain and loss that we feel. Sophie. Phil, thank you. No Conservative politicians or officials will face charges for breaches of expenses rules during the 2015 general election. The Crown Prosecution Service said it had examined evidence from 14 police forces in England, but it did not meet the test for further action. But the CPS is still considering the case of the Conservative campaign in South Thanet. With me now is our Home Affairs correspondent Tom Simons, and remind us what this was all about. Well, it goes back to the 2015 election campaign, which seems a long time ago now. And the allegation then was that the Conservatives nationally were sending battle buses full of activists out to marginal constituencies to help the candidates uh, campaign and the claim was that, that wrongly uh, that spending the cost of that was being put on a national uh, spending uh, uh, release that has to go to the electoral commission rather than the local spending uh, assessment and uh, the claim is that that was being done deliberately now the CPS has said today that it is an offence to knowingly make a false de declaration but there wasn't the evidence that the suspects in these cases MPs their agents uh, acted dishonestly in making inaccurate returns to the Electoral Commission so there can't be any charges and that's in 14 police areas. The, the Conservative Party very pleased they say these were politically motivated and unfounded uh, complaints but there's a sting in the tail because one of the files relating to South Thanet in Kent has not been considered yet by the CPS uh, and there could still be prosecutions there and the problem is that tomorrow is the closing date for any candidates in the election to pull out. So uh, you can see that we won't hear about that by tomorrow and that will cause a headache for the Conservative Party. Tom, thank you. A man who was arrested close to Downing Street last month has appeared in court charged with preparation for a terrorist act. 27-year-old Khalid Mohammed Omar Ali from London is also charged with two counts of making or having explosives. Our Home Affairs correspondent June Kelly is outside Westminster Magistrates Court. June. Well, Sophie, those two explosives counts relate to alleged activity in Afghanistan in 2012. Khalid Mohammed Omar Ali spent a number of years abroad and then came back into Britain towards the end of last year. Now, two weeks ago, a member of his family became concerned about his behaviour and contacted the police. He was then put under surveillance, followed through London and eventually arrested in Westminster, close to Parliament Square, and a number of knives were recovered from the scene. Today at this hearing, uh, handcuffs, he wore handcuffs throughout the entire hearing. He came into the dock in handcuffs and they were kept on throughout. Also, unlike the rest of the court, he didn't stand up when the judge came in. And it also emerged that he has refused to have a lawyer. Now, when the various charges were put to him, he said that he did not recognise the charges and so would not be entering a plea. So pleas of not guilty were recorded. He has been remanded in custody and his next court appearance will be on May the 19th at the Old Bailey. Sophie. Jean, thank you. The time is very nearly quarter past one. Our top story this lunchtime. Political shockwaves in America as President Trump sacks the head of the FBI without warning. Mr Trump defends his decision saying James Comey had lost the confidence of many in Washington. 
are still to come. Looks great from the outside, but sounds terrible inside. Sydney Opera House gets a makeover to improve its notoriously bad acoustics. Later on BBC London, championing equality and making art accessible, the artistic director of the South Bank gets national recognition. And with a dry and sunny outlook for the day, Kate will be here with the weather. Billions of pounds invested in schools. That's what both Labour and the Liberal Democrats are promising if they win the general election. Labour says it would plough £5 billion more into schools in England. The Lib Dems are going further than that. They say they would invest an extra £7 billion across the UK over five years. Our political correspondent Leila Nathu has been looking at their plans. <laughs> It's an issue that's galvanised parents and teachers across England. Now school funding is firmly on the election agenda. Labour is pledging to transform an education system it says has been starved of money. Every child, whatever their background, will be given the opportunity to unlock their full potential. We will give further and technical education the parity of esteem that it deserves, not just with warm words, but with bold action. Labour are promising to create a national education service. Schools in England will get a £4.8 billion boost over the next four years, with £335 million to cushion losses from changes to the way government money is allocated. Under the plans, education maintenance allowance for college students and grants for university students would both be reintroduced, and adults would be able to retrain for free. So if I put maybe a quarter of a cup in... Pouring more money into the mix is also the Liberal Democrats' plan. £6 billion for schools in England over five years and extra for the devolved administrations. Two-thirds of schools, it now turns out today, are planning to lay off at least one teacher and lose at least one teaching post in the next two months. Under that kind of pressure, there needs to be a response, a fully costed response, to build a future for all of our children so that we can have decent education and be confident in that. Big plans, though, come with big bills. Both parties say they would reverse cuts to corporation tax to fund schools. Labour says the rate would rise from 19 to 26% by 2020. The Labour Party proposals would certainly raise more than enough from corporation tax to pay for these uh, increases in school funding. Uh, but, of course, an increase in corporation tax has significant economic effects. It will reduce investment by companies in the UK, and in the long run, it won't raise as much as it might in the short run as companies change their behaviour. Head teachers have protested that they're facing the biggest squeeze on school budgets for decades and say it will mean cuts to subjects and bigger class sizes. The Conservatives say schools have received record levels of funding and warn the opposition parties can't deliver on their promises. 1.8 million more children are in good and outstanding schools compared to 2010. You'll also be aware, I, I'm sure, that uh, education in England has been improving, while education in Scotland and Wales has been moving backward. I think you'll also be aware that the free schools that we've created have created good and outstanding school places in areas where they did not exist before. The government's plans to open new grammar and free schools and change the formula used to calculate school funding have both proved controversial. It's given the opposition parties ammunition to take their electoral battle to the classroom. Leila Nathu, BBC News, Westminster. Our assistant political editor, Norman Smith, is in Westminster. So Labour and the Liberal Democrats pledging billions more for schools. Do the figures add up? Well, under both their plans, it's business who's going to have to pay up and under Labour's plans pay up an awful lot more because Mr Corbyn's plans for schools really are hugely ambitious talking about a national education service to mirror the national health service in other words free lifelong learning for everyone from cradle to grave so getting rid of fees for adults who want to return to colleges, reintroducing, uh, or sorry, scrapping, um, sorry, reintroducing maintenance grants for uh, students and a massive building programme. Now that alone costs around 30 billion. When you add on to that, possibly scrapping tuition fees as well, that comes to nearly 50 billion. And to pay for that, Labour are suggesting business should face an increase in corporation tax of more than a third. Now that is probably the biggest hike in business taxes as we've seen in an awfully long time. Labour say, well, business will benefit from a more productive workforce, but if you're a businessman or woman coping with the uncertainties of Brexit, 
You might think a huge tax bill is the last thing you need. Norman Smith, thank you. Now, one of the most hotly contested battlefields during general elections is the West Midlands, with its cluster of marginal seats which have a habit of swinging back and forth between Labour and the Conservatives. And this one is no exception. A succession of senior politicians have already beaten a path to the region's doorstep, as our West Midlands political editor, Patrick Burns, reports. Where once they built Spitfire fighters in Erdington, they now make Jaguar cars. One reason why the Midlands is the only UK region running a trade surplus with China. But if having a prized business asset like that on its doorstep really does much for Erdington itself, well, there's precious little evidence of it here in and around the High Street. It's one of the most deprived constituencies in Britain. 63% of the electorate here voted leave in the referendum. And for many voters here, there's no doubt about the number one issue now. Brexit's matter is what happens now. Now we know that it's actually going to go ahead and we've got a date. Well, I think we should have more say in our government. The EU didn't give us that, did they? The election last week of a Conservative Midlands Metro mayor sent out the clearest signal yet that some old political assumptions may need a rethink. Walsall has two marginal Labour constituencies. It voted for a Tory mayor. Those of us with long memories recall Margaret Thatcher telling her supporters exactly 30 years ago that they still had to win back the big cities. All but one of Birmingham's 10 constituencies are currently held by Labour. This time, though, Erdington is one of at least four seats in the city where the Conservatives reckon they're in with a chance. It's also where Theresa May's Joint Chiefs of Staff, Nick Timothy, grew up. So Erdington is also code for those ordinary working people who are just about managing. More jobs, more living accommodation, and more apprentices. Um, jobs, you know, for training young people. There are too many young people being wasted. This means health education and employment. The way the NHS is going, yeah, that's another real big problem. It's really strained, so... So it's not mainly about Brexit, as far as you're concerned? No, I'm not worried about Brexit. You can see Birmingham's changing skyline from out here too, one of Britain's business hotspots. But which party has the best plan to drive all that economic energy towards the places barely three miles away that need it most? Forget Middle England, it's in the city that you'll find the front line now. Patrick Burns, BBC News, Birmingham. It has killed nearly 100 dogs in the UK since it first appeared here five years ago, yet little is known about the disease called Alabama rot. First discovered in America in the late 1980s, it causes lesions on dogs' legs and paws, but there's still no known cure, which is why vets and animal welfare groups are meeting in Reading today for the first time in a bid to tackle it. Duncan Kennedy reports. It's that time of day. The walk, the run, the fun repeated by 8 million dogs across the United Kingdom. But for Gabrielle Williams from Monmouthshire, those joys came to an end earlier this year. Her dog, Fleur, a family pet for five years, caught Alabama rot and died. It's still hard to get your head round that she's not here because it happened so quickly and she was quite young. She was only five and a half and it was hard to see. So, yeah, it's been very difficult, very sad. Alabama rot was first recorded in the United States in the 1980s and gives dogs lesions, ulcers and, in many cases, kidney failure. So it's a very unpleasant disease and luckily Lola here has avoided it. But 15 dogs in Britain have died from Alabama rot so far this year, bringing the total to nearly 100 since it was first noticed in 2012. Those first cases were seen in Hampshire, but there have now been examples in 29 counties, yet with no obvious pattern to the location or breed. So what you want to be looking for is on Cetus Paul. Today's first ever conference on Alabama rot in Britain has been organised by David Walker, a vet who studied it for five years. So what's your gut feeling of what this is then? So uh, I would say my gut feeling is that uh, intrinsically within the dog they have a predisposition to this disease process uh, and then perhaps there's an environmental trigger on top that means they develop the disease later on in their lifetime. It's certainly a disease these owners in the New Forest are now aware of. Until I see any signs again or anything up here 
um, I just keep going like normal, I think. They don't know what's causing it or anything, so I mean, you've just got to continue as normal, really. Here's the deal, Paul. Uh, nobody's behind that camera, so I can do this just unloaded as well, of course. But I mean, if I'm pointing a gun right at you, okay, like North Korea is threatening Japan to nuke Tokyo, they're threatening uh, to attack Seoul, South Korea. They say they have the missiles, they're shooting them every week. They say they're going to nuke the U.S. task force. Don't they understand that the United States, Japan, everybody, Russia, quite frankly, has is, is threatened to nuke China before they were doing this. Don't they understand that we have a right when they're threatening us and pointing right at us for us to pull the trigger preemptively to stop them, Paul? China has now come out and said that they will attack North Korea's nuclear facilities if it crosses a red line. So now China is basically betraying its own ally, saying that they will create a red line. Well, let me just stop you. Back. That's because Trump told him he's ready to go to war and he's serious. Here's Reuters. They turned back. Uh, North Korea's main export is coal and slave labor to China. They turned back four ships, five ships that had coal on them going back. So it looks like China actually bought into what Trump was saying. It looks like Trump's brinkmanship is working. Let's talk about your source. That's huge, Paul. Uh, your source has been accurate. Who is this source uh, saying this, what happened, and now it's happened? Well, it's Jack Posobiec, who is coming on at 33 after. And like I said, you know, he was told 75% certainty they would strike Syria hours before when nobody expected it. It happened. Same source is telling him they're going to go into North Korea imminently. So we're going to get into it. He's got the source. So well, to I'm be gonna, clear, uh, I mean, I'm not, I'm not knocking him. He's a good guy. I know he is. We said hours before they probably hit it right when the Chinese president met. I mean, he had signaled that. The, 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 uh, you're the expert on the source. This source way before said this was going to happen? No, this, this just came out today with the North Korea issue. So, you know, I'm going to get into it at 33 after. Well, let's talk about other... that because Trump says he's prepared the military to hit. Uh, China seems to be, I agree with your source. Uh, I, mean, well, I didn't see that. Where did China say they're ready to hit uh, North Korea? It's uh, headline, China threatens to bomb North Korea's nuclear facilities if it crosses Beijing's bottom line. So now they've got a bottom line. They came out in their official Global Times, which is like the communist mouthpiece. It's sure. basically straight from the government and said, I can quote it, China has a bottom line that it will protect at all costs. It goes on to say, China will employ by all means available, including the military means to strike back. It's not an issue of discussion whether China acquiesces, but the Chinese People's Liberation Army will launch attacks against DPRK nuclear facilities on its own. So, they're so this shows Trump North literally throw. That's what I was told. Trump said, look, I'm ready to go. They've got everybody in place. Well, let's just point this out. Everybody says China runs North Korea. That's not the intel I get. It sounds like North Korea is out of control. That's the way to do this. Let China strike North Korea then. Well, I mean, it's interesting, Alex. I did a poll. It's 50-50 amongst Trump supporters, Trump voters, whether they endorse an attack on North Korea. I mean, at least you could say North Korea is directly threatening the U.S., on a weekly basis, if, if not more, they're belligerent, they're aggressive, they're threatening a sixth n a nuclear test, they're lobbing ballistic missiles into the Sea of Japan on an, on an almost weekly basis now. So you could at least make the argument, I guess, constitutionally, that they represent a threat to the United States. Sure, let me be clear. Do that if I'm yourself. pointing a gun at you and I say my finger's on the trigger, I'm going to shoot you. You have a right then to shoot me because I'm threatening to do it. Kim Jong-un is ready for war as China moves 140,000 troops to this border after Donald Trump sends warships to North Korea. They're threatening North Korea is to, to nuke the carrier task force. Do they understand the United States has 20 to 1 superiority over China? No, exactly. But, the, of course, the threat is the escalation. As soon as uh, the U.S. attacks North Korea, they will lob missiles into South Korea. They will attack South Korea, and it could be the start of World War III. That's why people are concerned about I don't that. think it could be. I think if a shooting war starts, nukes will be used. No, I agree. And we need to have room for that debate. The most concerning thing to me, Alex, is uh, a lot of Trump supporters are not on InfoWars. You probably noticed this. They're completely on our side in terms of being against a military escalation in Syria, against toppling Assad, because it's proven completely disastrous every time we've done it in the past. But then if you look at the polls, for example, 86% of Republicans support the attack on Syria. 86%. 
Uh, roughly the same number of Democrat support as supported an attack on Syria under Obama back in 2013. But his actual approval rating hasn't moved. It's basically stayed the same, the general approval rating. So yeah, well, those numbers I mean, are the fake. Was the approval ratings are totally fake, but I totally agree with you. This is a crisis. Here's the deal. North Korea is threatening to attack everybody. China's been backing all this belligerence. So they're the ones starting the fight. That's why here I'm supporting the president being strong. Syria didn't start the war. Syria didn't do anything. We're backing the wrong people in Syria. That's why I'm against it. It's all moral standing, Paul. Yeah, and we're just maintaining the principle that we've had for the six-year-long Syrian civil war. The other argument they've got, I mean, I'm concerned because I'm seeing a lot of Trump supporters you know, basically turning it into a cult of personality where they say, I will support anything if Trump says it's the right thing to do. Well, are they going to support him if he starts barbecuing babies on the White House lawn? You know, 400,000 Syrian people, both military and civilians, have died in the six-year war. Assad didn't just suddenly start killing his own people. It's a civil war. The jihadists are killing their own people. That's what it is. So what changed from March 31st, when Rex Tillerson said, Assad is part of the future of Syria, to now we must have regime change in Syria. Something changed, because it wasn't the chemical weapons attack. There have been attacks on both sides. They've killed each other. And that's what Michael Savage asked now. last hour. I'm skipping this break so we have more time. Why? What do you think it is that changed? I think it was the demotion of Bannon from the National Security Council and the fact that Trump's being surrounded by neocons. And, you know, I've gone on record opposing that. I think it's a very concerning development. And it's concerning that a lot of Trump supporters are start not our base, not the InfoWars base, Alex. If you go on InfoWars, you read the comments. These are high information readers. But a lot of the low information Trump voters will just go along with whatever he says, not knowing that it's because he's, he's come under pressure from the people who are surrounding him. You know, back on March 11th, I said... I went through his foreign policy advisors one by one. You know, 25, 30 of them, half of them at least were CFR members back then. And it's like, well, yeah, some of them- Absolutely, it's the same people. Chance. And what we care about yeah. is him getting policy done. If he hires goblins to investigate Mordor, that's fine. Just don't become Mordor. We don't want to yeah. catch him in bed with a goblin. But, but, but looking at this, if China is now threatening to attack North Korea, to stop them. If China just turned back North Korean coal, their main funding, it looks like Trump's brinksmanship and McMaster's brinksmanship might actually be working. Again, I'm not defending this type of brinksmanship, but it looks like it might be working. Well, I mean, you know, but we had the Korean War, which killed like 1.2 million people. That's going to be child's play compared to a nuclear escalation in that part of the world. You know, 33,000 dead troops in the Korean War. At what risk? Are they putting the Look, I agree. Out, like I've got children. I don't want this risk, Paul. I'm just saying, yeah. preliminarily, it looks like this brinksmanship in the Korean Peninsula is going the way of Trump. China is signaling all over the place that they're, they are now doing what the U.S. says. Well, we're going to have to wait and see. We know that basically South Koreans are panicking. Their government had to come out and quell their fears that there's going to be imminent war. You have an, an expert, we just got the article up on InfoWars a couple of hours ago, he says that there's a plan to strike the North Korean main nuclear reactor. What will that lead to environmentally? But there's a plan for that. And as I said earlier, this, this source has told Jack Possibly, I'm going to get him on, that it's 50% likely that there's going to be an imminent strike on North Korea. Well, Trump's so already said that. Escalating quickly. And, and they've already got everybody ready. to. They're also going to kill Kim Jong-un. So he better be in a deep, deep bunker right now because, let me tell you, they got the space-based weapons trained on his ass. Uh, what do you think overall about the situation, Paul? I think there is more support amongst Trump voters for an attack on North Korea than there was Syria. Because even among... Yeah, because they're threatening people, everybody. Yeah, well, he's threatening everybody. You can make the argument from that angle. You know, they've got 200,000 people in gulags, political prisoners. Um, this, this is a dictator armed with nuclear weapons. Nobody can deny that. I think it's very different to the situation in Syria. But more Trump supporters support an attack on North Korea than they did on Syria. That much is clear. I think on Syria, um, this poll said 86% support it. 51% of Americans overall support the Trump strike on Syria. 
I think that would be higher in the case of North Korea. Oh, absolutely. Worldwide. I mean, I don't. Uh, no, we didn't start this with North Korea. The Clintons gave them the reactors to create the weapons. Here's the deal, Paul. Uh, nobody's behind that camera, so I can do this just unloaded as well, of course. But, I mean, if I'm pointing a gun right at you, okay, like North Korea is threatening Japan to nuke Tokyo, they're threatening uh, to attack Seoul, South Korea. They say they have the missiles, they're shooting them every week. They say they're going to nuke the U.S. task force. Don't they understand that the United States, Japan, everybody, Russia, quite frankly, has is, is threatened to nuke China before they were doing this. Don't they understand that we have a right when they're threatening us and pointing right at us for us to pull the trigger preemptively to stop them, Paul? Well, it's, it's a, be a better argument for it can be made than what's happening in Syria. Let's go to Devon in Florida. Devon in Florida, you're on the air. Great. Hey, thank you so much. Listen, I have bought your products, and I got to say they're amazing. Thank Anyone you. who's on the fence, buy it, because I've, I've got Caveman, Superman Vitality, Secret 12, Vitamin Mineral Fusion. I've got the body armor. Wow, thank you. Wow. You're I the mean, type of listener that makes it all possible. Which nutraceutical no, does you like best? I really like the, the Vitamin Mineral Fusion, to be honest. That's it's amazing. Really incredible. I drank it in the morning, and I swear to you, I felt incredible. Like, I haven't felt weak. My morning was fantastic, and I and I love you guys. I love the InfoWars crew, and I just want to, yeah, I want to I want to take this opportunity to tell anybody out there who's on the fence, just buy it. You will love it. I'm telling you, I've never bought a bad product. What you find in our news is the same thing you find in our products at InfoWarsLife.com. It's a win-win, InfoWarsLife.com.